Okay. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Naomi Rankin. I'm the leader of the Communist Party in Alberta. And uh, the session that we have planned today is to discuss the question of social services and social spending generally in Alberta, uh, what the government policy is, what's wrong with it, what the party's, our party policy is. This is part of a discussion that's um, leading up to a, a sort of pre-election period that will, so that these discussions will help us to refine and improve the platform that we put forward to the public during the election campaign. Uh, so uh, we look forward to your comments and, and remarks on this. So I'm going to make I'm going to make a presentation. It won't be terribly long. And I hope that we can that the bulk of the time we can have for discussion. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that we various people are attending here from different pl places around the province, which means that we are attending from the territory of, of several different treaties. Uh, it's the position of the Communist Party of Canada that we fully acknowledge the Indigenous rights, including the right of self-government of Indigenous nations, and that we support the struggles of Indigenous people for autonomy and uh, controlling their own development within their own communities. We further acknowledge that the history of the, the negotiation of treaties has been one-sided, um, has not been entered into in good faith on behalf of the either the British imperial colonial government or the Canadian government in the 150 years since Confederation, and that we are committed to the support of Indigenous rights, Indigenous self-government, and the renegotiating renegotiation on e terms of equality amongst nations. So on to the actual topic at hand today. Um, I don't. I don't want to talk up in great detail about the uh, just what the uh, provincial government has done, or how many how many millions of dollars they've cut from education, how many million from healthcare, how nefarious it is, and so on. I think probably you know people are generally aware of this situation. Um, what I wanted to do is actually kind of take a step back and talk about the whole history of like the strategy of, of capitalism with respect to um, you know, the rights uh, benefits of the working class and um, economic policy really generally, like to put it, to have a context, a historical context of why, why, do they, why are they doing this and, and why do they keep doing this? Why do they keep cutting the spending and whittling away at social services? Um, so, it's kind of like a, a capsule history of the whole 20th century, really. Um, I mean, I, I'd start with World War I, the end of World War I and the Soviet Revolution. That a lot of the history of capitalism in the course of the whole 20th century has been in response to the, the Soviet Union, in response to the, the need to look better than socialism. So, although there's also been, you know, a great deal of repression by capitalist governments in the over the course of the 20th century, this is one of the underlying themes, especially in the um, North America and the, the uh, imperial center, the more developed capitalist countries, that there's been a need um, for the whole period from 1917 to 1992 to look better than socialism, to fend off the, the very powerful argument that socialism could provide a better life for working people. So it's given rise to the, the need to provide unemployment insurance, Medicare, uh, subsidized education, um, some minimal uh, social supports, uh, you know, such as welfare. Uh, in many countries, you know, support for public uh, housing, that's one area in which North America really lies behind compared to the European imperial powers. But, but that's not the only uh, response that capitalism has had to the Soviet revolution. There's also the response of 
naked aggression and attempts to, to destroy the, the socialist revolution. Uh, immediately after that revolution, the, you know, the, the various Western powers conspired to invade and attempt to overthrow the revolution. And it was a, it was a very difficult close fought battle for several years before the Soviets gained uh, military control in their own territory. And even like on through the twenties, there's still this, um, this tension between the need to make some concessions to the working class to fend off revolutionary impulses and the desire to repress any kind of working class movement. So uh, this became even more acute in the, after the second, in, in the, during the Great Depression, right, when obviously there's a great deal of misery, there's a great deal of dissatisfaction. That was the period of the development of Keynesianism as an economic theory, where the idea that government should deliberately spend more during downturns of the economy in order to stimulate demand. And that would in, help to prop up uh, employment levels and smooth out the ups and downs of the business cycle. Uh, so Keynesianism was in fact, uh, more or less official policy of, uh, you know, of the, 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 uh, the state theory of economics for, some, for several decades. Immediately after the Second World War, um, once again, there were two different responses to the attractions of the Soviet Union, which after all, up throughout the war were our brave Russian allies. The prestige of the Soviet Union in defeating uh, Nazism was very high. So once again, there was a twofold response. One was a Cold War, a really severe, uh, fierce propaganda campaign attempting to portray the Soviet Union as, as a, an aggressive danger to the world. And, but the second was the, the construction of the welfare state in the developed world. Once again, to provide um, enough mitigation of the effects of capitalist exploitation that workers would not be driven to consider a revolutionary alternative. But the, the post-war period also was a period of, of uh, easy economic expansion for capitalism because even because of the, of the in, incredible destruction caused by the Second World War, there was really a need to be built. There were abundant places for capital to be invested. There were opportunities for capital. And this continued on really for uh, a, a couple of decades until the, the obvious sort um, places for capital to, to go, the obvious uh, investments were essentially saturated. But this was also the period of the decolonization and national liberation, nat national liberation struggles around the world in the civil rights movement in, in the US. So through the 60s, there was this expansion of social services, the expansion of the, of the uh, concept that, the, that people were entitled to some um, social safety net and some, some rights. By, but by the mid seventies, right, the, the colon, decolonization had been essentially completed. The last outliers like the Portuguese colonies gaining their independence, uh, you know, Mozambique in 1974, the Vietnamese military victory over the US invaders in 1975. So essentially, the, the decolonization was complete. But even from the, you know, from the earliest days after the Second World War, the a, a neo-colonialist colonialist response was developing of ways to continue to exploit the, the former colonies without having direct state control. So the 50s and the 60s is also the era of CIA sponsored coups and assassinations in countries attempting to assert their independence. This continues like under different names and different um, government agencies in the US right up to the present day, you know, policies of regime, regime change against any government who's, who attempts to assert their independence from the, the uh, international economic order that the US imperialism wishes to impose. So, 
And there was also a, a, an economic response, uh, an economic neo-colonial response, um, which, which you could see like in the International Monetary Fund and the coercion that they would impose on countries that, were, that needed loans, where the, a condition of, of money from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund was restructuring, was cutbacks on social spending. And in, which no matter what the cost to that country, no matter how much that would set back their general economic development. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this policy as well has continued on through the present day, up through the modern free trade agreements that champion the interests of multinationals over and above any kind of um, independent national rights of the countries who participate. Uh, so, but by the mid 80s, that easy post-war expansion was over and the limitations of Keynesian, Keynesianism were becoming more apparent. So, so at this point, you, you'd, you'd had the development of a new ideological mechanism to, to reverse course for a counter-offensive by capital in the form of uh, what we now call neoliberalism and, and, and a supply side economics. Like, uh, Milton Friedman, Friedman, Friedman is one of the names associated with it. It's essentially a new supposed economic theory, which was a, a counter offensive against social spending in support of cutbacks, deregulation and tax cuts. Uh, the, so the 80s, this is the, this is the mid 80s. This is the period of the election of Reagan in the US and Thatcher in Britain, when they began a very vigorous policies of deregulation, um, you know, allow, allow, allowing much more free reign to corporations, uh, tax cuts, disproportionately tax cuts to corporations, but overall, you know, re reducing in the sources of government revenue. And correspondingly, the cuts to social services, health and education that would be necessitated if you have few, less in the way of, of in government revenue. And of course, in Alberta, this came to fruition with the election of Ralph Klein in 1992, which also this coincided with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, the, the uh, socialist um, countries of Europe. So this essentially opened up an era when they did not have to compete with the Soviets they didn't have to prove themselves to be better than socialism. Like Thatcher openly saying, there is no alternative. So um, it came a little bit later in, in Alberta because uh, our economy had been buffered by the enormous wealth of, uh, you know, coming from the uh, energy sector, even with uh, unnecessarily low tax rates and unnecessarily low royalties, which we talked about at our last meeting, there was still so much money floating around that the effect of the of cuts was not felt until uh, 92 when, you know, Ralph Klein became premier in 93, um, when they began real, you know, real wholesale cuts to health and education spending. And this has essentially continued ever since. Um, you know, with a very partial exception of, of the Ed Stelmach period, Ed, when Ed Stelmach was premier, he, he actually suggested that maybe they should have a look again at what, what, the, what would be appropriate royalty rates. And he was soon knifed in the park by, knifed in the back by his own party for this suggestion. So the, 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 the Conservative Party under very, whatever named has all along been wedded to the, uh, corporate interest of the multinational corporations, predominantly those in the energy sector. And so over and over again, they've taken every opportunity to cut revenues by, by giving tax royalties and tax royalties uh, holidays to those corporations and under their, thereby undermining government revenues and relentlessly continuing to cut social services and riddle away at the standard of living that the base, the, the baseline standard of living, right? Um, in order to do this though, they can't only make those economic cuts. They also have to attack 
labor rights and social rights generally, because people don't just passively accept these kinds of cuts. So this goes hand in hand with attempts to, to whittle away uh, trade union rights. Um, the, uh, under uh, Kenny, they, they were particularly aggressive in this, in trying to uh, pre essentially prevent labor unions from doing anything in response to any of these government campaigns. Uh, so I'd say that the um, election of Daniel Smith is essentially, it's simply a continuation of the same policy that every subsequent premier now for, you know, for some period of time, and setting aside the interregnum of the, of the NDP, every uh, succeeding conservative premier has been more and more right-wing, more and more subservient to these corporate interests, and more, more and more willing to cut social spending. So like under the Kenny regime, they were whittling away. I mean, there were major cuts to, to public education at, at all levels, you know, 500 million, major attacks on, on health care, uh, attempts to to, to, to destroy you know, any kind of public housing or subsidized housing, like real you know, serious uh, privatization, um, cutting, cutting the uh, cost of living index, like essentially it, um, effectively reducing AISH, the assistance for individuals, because you know, which supports the most vulnerable people at the lowest possible level of, of subsistence. So, it's quite clear that there's really no limit to the how low that they can go. Uh, the only limitation is how much will the working class organize itself to fight back? And so this is this is the open question, and this is the point at which we uh, have to attempt to intervene. We as communists, how much can you know? What can we do to help promote a mass movement that will have a clear understanding of these kinds of cutbacks? And will fight back against them and respond with a and have a positive program of its own, you know, with a, with a different way of approaching. This. Um, it's not uh, inevitable that those particular corporations must have the upper hand in all matters. That's a political response, and there can be a different one. Right? So the the Alberta Federation of Labor, you know, recently has had several campaigns. Um, despite the fact that they're hampered by the, you know, having to also fight just for the bare right to express any political opinions in the name of the, of the labor movement. So for example, last fall, for example, they came out with a, a report that they called Industrial Blueprint for Job Creation and Prosperity. It's it somewhat, it pretty much parallels what has been called just transitions by some other movements about the, the attempt to diversify the economy to provide employment uh, in response to the dwindling employment in the energy sector. They had a, actually a you know, quite clever um, publicity campaign for talking about, you know, skate to where the puck is, is going. Like, <laughs> that is plan for the future instead of simply um, responding passively to past economic realities. And also, more recently, the, the Federation of Labor has had several other sort of public uh, pronouncements and campaigns, one about the cost of living, which is, you know, um, calling on, on Albertans to, to lobby their MLAs, like to tackle inflation, to tackle price gouging, including taxing excess profits that corporations have been able to um, make, take advantage of um, in this period of, of inflation. So, that's actually, I think, a fairly strong uh, set of, of demands that, relatively strong set of demands that the AFL has been able to make. And they've also, you know, they did some videos exposing the, the absurdity of, of uh, you know, far right sort of propaganda, the far right uh, attitudes of Danielle Smith. Um, particularly about the blaming Ottawa, like the attempt to foment uh, regional bigotry. And the, the most recently, the AFL has come out with uh, uh, you know, several pronouncements like calling on uh, Albertans to rally around to protect the Canada pension. 
but to to attempt to foil the uh, conservative attempt to provincialize the pension, to seize the Alberta section of the Canada pension, uh, which we know would be a pretty bad idea because we could be pretty sure that they would that they would simply use that as a slush fund to continue to subsidize the energy sector, and then it would be all gone, along with our our possibility of having the pensions that we in fact have been paying into. So, but I'd also like to just you know, just talk about what's the underlying cause of why this this counteroffensive against social services and against social spending. Essentially, it's a counteroffensive against government revenues and government um, conducting the 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 economy. And it's not just an it's not just an abstract ideological objection to government being involved in the economy. Um, it there's there's real reasons why the the corporate sector finds itself up against the reality under capitalism of a declining rate of profit. This is, you know, the, going right back to the, to the mid 1800s, Marx and Engels, uh, you know, studied this and talked about the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Essentially, as the all the the most profitable areas of the economy are invest, all the are invested in, and those those parts of the economy are saturated with capital. There are fewer and fewer opportunities for capital to make a profit. Um, so, the in fact, the reality is that governments don't the governments don't behave in a laissez-faire manner. None of them ever have, including the ones who most claim to be led by that kind of ideology. They in fact intervene as much as they can to provide opportunities for corporations to invest and to eliminate the risk to the corporations to guarantee profits for investments that may or may not make economic sense from the point of view of producing value. They still, in fact, um, you know, the, the uh, governments all, including the parties that most claim to believe in small government, they only believe in small government when it's, it's a question of intervening on behalf of the working people to support their standard of living and their labor rights. They do not, in fact, engage in that same kind of small government uh, behavior when it's, a, when it's a matter of subsidizing corporations, even the largest of them. So the, the, this neoliberalism, this, this policy, and supply side economics, it is in fact not just an attack on the working class it, for the, to maximize the profits of the corporations. It's, it goes as far as even be, it's an attack upon essentially every other sector other than the largest corporations. Like it works against the, the petty bourgeoisie, the small producers, the small formerly independent producers. It works even against like national bourgeoisie, like people who are corporations, small corporations or companies that work to supply a, a local market who would tend, like, tend to be more involved in actual productive parts of the economy. Um, so it, in, it's in fact a policy to support the largest corporations. And this is also a reason why you see it happening really on a global scale. It has its special features in Alberta, but it's a problem that that the, we're having to grapple with really in every capitalist country in the world. Um, so the question of the of what kind of a fight back there's going to be is is I'm afraid still an open question. We would love to see a really mass vigorous response on behalf of working people all over the province, rising up and indignantly um, repudiating what this government is trying to do. But in fact, I'm afraid we don't see that, that that mass resistance and mass struggle against it still has to be built. So that's part of our job as communists. That's part of the process of building class consciousness is to involve ourselves in the struggles that really do exist, right? That people must engage in right now, um, even if they don't have a, 
long-term revolutionary point of view, they actually have to fight for their own um, well-being and their own livelihood right now in the face of insecurity, uh, inflation, and so on. So I'll just mention this is not directly um, the topic at hand, but it is the case that our party, the Communist Party of Canada, is, is, is launching a campaign across the country to uh, roll back prices, uh, protect incomes, uh, and to tax the corporations. Uh, so some, you know, there'll be some more material coming out on that point soon, because that is a point of where we can engage with working people at all different levels of political development. That that's something that we have to fight for right now. Uh, but what's different is the Communist Party is going to fight for that in the context of a larger strategy of building up a more united and class conscious, conscious working class movement that could ultimately turn around and not just to be defensive, but to take the offensive, to begin to actually make some move towards nationalizing, taking control of the economy and building towards socialism. So I'm not gonna say much more about that. As I say, I don't, I don't think I need to you know, talk a lot about the, de the, the factual details of, of, of what's happening with social services. I'm sure everyone here has some experiences of their own that they can talk about this. So at this point, I'd like to just throw it open for a general discussion. So if anybody, if you wish to either raise your hand or if, if you can't do that, just speak up. Okay, I see MJ, I'm not sure who that is, but yes, go ahead. Hi, Naomi. It's more again. Oh, yes. um, How are you doing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> super good. I just finished reading uh, Wage Labor Capital um, by Marx, and mm -hmm. I'm also often working on foreign policy. So, um, thinking a lot about the inflation crisis and the affordability crisis, the NDP, for example, is directing the unions, um, mm -hmm. you know, telling them you know, where to place the struggle and where um, political organizations and unions can work together. And of course, they're telling them to blame the petty, um, the petty bosses rather than looking at the international crisis, the war and the um, monopoly category of uh, corporate profits, super profits that have benefited and exploited the war in order to uh, double the revenue so, for example, oil and gas, LNG interest and future um, hydrogen interest, um, thrusting markets in Europe into monopolies. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess my question is, how do we frame the importance of fighting imperialism when there is a struggle right in front of us for working people where we do still need to fight our bosses? That's important. But the NDP will not admit that they support the crisis in, in the way that it has directly resulted in the destruction of the consumer price index through sanctions, economic displacement and war. And uh, Canadian oil and gas interest is, is doubling just as Exxon and Chevron um, in the United States. So obviously they're covering their butts and they're protecting corporate interests by telling people to blame it on their petty bosses rather than the, the corporate monopoly bosses. Mm -hmm. So how do we balance the two? <laughs> well, that's a very big question, isn't it? Like, you know, it's, there's no easy answer to that. Right? I mean, that what, what you've essentially what you've done there is you've re, you've reworded what is what is political strategy, right? What is our political strategy? So if anybody else has any good, you know, clear, incisive uh, answers to that, I'd be happy to hear it. But um, I think the, the situation is even is really even more complicated than, than what you've described because I don't think that the the unions are actually at the beck and call of the NDP. Um, if anything, 
the, you know, the, the problem is that the unions are starting to come even more, you know, less under the um, guidance of the NDP and they're starting to flirt with the liberals or even the conservatives in different parts of the country. That the, um, so, but of course, you know, we we never supported that the that the unions and the NDP should be like organically linked, although that might just appear to be self-serving. <laughs> that we want the we would prefer unions to be linked to our party, but it's it's not that we think that, that it's important that the unions should have their own independent vigor in the in the political arena. They should be putting forward their own point of view, and so. Yeah, it, it's a problem about how to get them to, I think in fact that, you know, if you actually look at what the Alberta Federation of Labor has done, it isn't so really bad. We know that in, in effect, they want to elect, get the NDP elected and not the conservatives. And that they, we know that they would, there'd be a real problem with them not directly confronting the NDP once the NDP does form the government again. But in fact, what they are saying now is, it's not what it, it, it's not what communists would say, but in fact, it's not that bad. They are actually addressing, you know, quite a few of the main issues. They seem to have figured out a way of doing it, like navigating the difficulty of not seeming to simply criticize their own members for having for you know having been uh, fooled by right wing ideology in the past. So, um, I think the essentially like the way forward is like we have to find ways of engaging in a really practical day to way, day way in those um in in the you know in those fight back activities even the very modest ones even the smallest opportunity to get people into action criticizing the government or questioning government policies you know we know that you know we we're not in a mature revolutionary situation. So we have to recognize that we need to, to seize even the smallest, most modest opportunities to, you know, to engage in that sort of ideological battle, I think. I see, I see Jesse has their hand up. Freedom. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you. It's a, it's a very good introduction to the party's platform. Um, so I really appreciate that, Naomi. It's a good introduction to to the platform and to the uh, to the material history behind it. Um, like we're not just talking about ideology here; we're talking about the material reality of the exploitation and the the disempowerment of the working class. Um, and the question that seems to be asked right now um, to me is um, like, what can be done to help along a mass movement? Um, and I think I think part of it, personally, is that. No one talks about what this mass movement ought to look like. Um, we talk about it as if it's going to be a mass movement against the government. But um, as you said, the government itself is, at this point, subservient. Um, you might even say like a victim of large corporate interests. Um, attacking the government isn't going to be helpful so long as they're being so heavily funded by these corporate interests. So my take um, is and has been um, based on action that was taken by the Japanese Communist Party shortly after World War II um, has a, a history of successfully um, cooperatizing industry as a form Sorry. of protest. Sorry, can I just interrupt for a moment? I think, Blythe, yeah. you're, Blythe I think your mic's on. We're getting some noise. Can you mute? Oh, yeah, a little bit. And I see oh, Helen as well. Like Whoever whoever is, is not muted, please mute themselves other than Jesse. Okay, care <laughs> Mute, mute. Um, yeah, just talking about... Um, corporatizing industry the japanese communist party has a history of um some very um heavy success um in cooperatizing industry as a form of protest and as like a form of seizing the means of production and direct action taken to empower workers and disempower um capitalists um that is taking over industry and essentially kicking their bosses out but continuing to work under a uh, new cooperative being formed um by that by the workplace um, you know, until the police come. <laughs> but um, like, it doesn't necessarily need a lot of people to get started. It just needs to happen in multiple places at once and just to get that ball rolling. And I think you were talking about clear cut goals, like elections where you can say cut and dry, we have done this. Um, 
is that sort of cooperatization something that could be positioned as a potential goal in that matter? I know it's a large goal, but it's at least um, a direction that can be taken. Well, it it's a, yeah, it's what you've said talked about. It's a very interesting thing. Like it's it kind of a sort of a form of kind of direct action, like where people just immediately, as opposed to having a sit down strike, they 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 lock out the bosses kind of. So, but again, it basically, it just all depends. There's all different kinds of uh, strategies that can be used. And depending on the context, they could be a good idea or a bad idea. Right? Um, some, like, even if we look at like nationalization, generally speaking, we advocate for, you know, for nationalizing all the major, the commanding heights of the economy, all the major, corporations in corporate entities in all the major sectors, you know, banks, mines, railroads, the energy sector, so on. But even nationalization can sometimes just be used as a tool of, you know, of government to subsidize corporations. Like when, if they take over a failing um, company, it's, and, and pay for it, essentially they're bailing out, they're, they're subsidizing the the owners, they're paying the owners of that corporation for their failure, and they're taking on the, the um, subsidizing the rest of the economy by, by you know, keeping a, a non-profitable corporation going. So even, even nationalizing can be, can be used against the working class. It can be used to continue to funnel more of the wealth of society into, into corporate profits. Um, Sometimes, you know, sometimes some of those kinds of actions like taking over a factory can be, you know, like a step forward for the working class. There's other times when they've just been, again, they've been fooled into, into buy, buying out the bosses of a failing company, you know, so that the, the former owners are guaranteed their price, but then the workers are stuck with the, the debts and the company that's going to fail. That has happened in the past too. So there's been occasions, you know, when, our party has advised the workers that maybe it's not such a good idea <laughs> to form a co-op and try to keep that plant going. It, it, it's, it really depends on the context. So besides doing the economic analysis of what's, what would work, what would actually be productive and contribute to the economy, there's also the, the complicated question of what would be useful for as an experience for the workers to gain the experience of, of taking control and running things themselves and what lessons they will draw from that. You know, how will that help to contribute to the development of class consciousness and class unity? Again, really, you know, a really complex question, no very simple answers for that. But obviously there's, there's really no strategy or, or activity that is, would be totally off the table. It always depends on the context about what would be helpful. So, Trace, go ahead. Oh, well, it looks like Trace has, has uh, actually disappeared. No, I, I'm here. Oh, I'm there. Oh, there. Okay. Turn your hand down, I've got the mute. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, no, I was just saying that the the unions and cooperatives and all that are all good ideas. I agree with that. But um, how do we get people even to the point where they're going to want to unionize workplaces that aren't, or if they are cooperatives, um, to to move in, well, if they're unionized, move into cooperatives, rather. Um, I mean, we or any other direction, if most workers don't even want to consider um, discussing unionize, unionizing their... You know, unionizing their workplaces. I mean, I've been trying uh, <laughs> when I can to, to get a union going to my own workplace and nobody wants to do it because they just see it as a temporary job or the bosses are too nice or or they leave <laughs> or um, yeah, or they hear that someone's talking about unionizing. It wasn't me this last time. Um, the rumors were starting to fly about, but all of a sudden, they're talking, oh, someone's talking about unionizing. Oh, they're going to get canned and stuff like that. Because the last person who did speak up loudly about unionizing, unionizing our place got 
fired, <laughs> coincidentally. Um, so yeah, how do we get people to that place in the first place? Okay, everybody's asking the really big strategic questions here. Yeah, once again, yeah, that's a very, you know, that's a, a very big question, a very difficult one. Um, so the, there's really, there, essentially no, none, no techniques are off the table. So it's, I think it really, um, that's the kind of question that, that, that has a lot of kind of local context. Like you may, it, you know, it, it might have to be a kind of workplace by workplace analysis of what, what's going to be the key issue or the turning point within this workplace. And I mean, you've, what you've described, I mean, it happens over and over. It takes a great deal of uh, patience and trying and trying again and uh, more unionizing attempts fail than succeed given the it's not just the difficulty of convincing the workers, you know, of raising class consciousness, but of course the rules, the rules for official unionization are stacked against the union uh, in places like Alberta. So um, it's an it's an intrinsically difficult process and would require long, slow, patient work. And as you've touched on, like so many jobs these days are are in precarious work where people are not there for a long time. That that certainly makes it more complex. The fact that deindustrialization also makes things much more complex. Like you don't have large, very large numbers of workers concentrated all in one place, all doing essentially the equivalent job. You have, you know, a lot of um, decentralized work, working from home, working on the basis of supposedly um, independent or temporary contracts all kinds of forms of fragmenting of the workforce that, that makes it that much harder. So, so you know, we, we still have to make the case. I mean, we still have to fight for uh, the, the attempts to unionize in the workplace. We still have to make the case that unions are in fact still important. Like, you know, I know, pe I know of people who will, I've had this conversation with people who say, oh, they, it, it used to be important. It used to be a good idea, but now the unions have, they've got everything that they, that they needed. So now they're only a problem, not a, um, a benefit. So, you know, we have, to, we have to continue to make the case and it, it's, it's a difficult one, that's true. So, uh, Helen. Well, I uh, work in a unionized environment. Mm -hmm. I see the problem as such. I don't think the union is uh, effective enough. Mm -hmm. uh, by saying that, I don't mean that we shouldn't unionize. There are still, it's still better to have a union than not to have a union. Yeah. Uh, that's for sure. But uh, some of my coworkers do not see the union as useful as they are supposed to be. And this part, part of the reason is like, um, it's an employer's market. It's, you know, the uh, employees are more vulnerable. But I also think the unions, they are not as aggressive and as strategic enough to advocate for workers' rights. I think if they can do more and make people see more benefits to be part of a union, that will help the union movement. That's, yes. One, one of the things I'd point out though, is like part of the problem, the reason for the weakness of the unions is the absence of the, the communists in the union movement. I mean, look, you know, looking back over the whole history of the union movement in, in Canada, the communists played a really disproportionate role as you would expect in initially organizing unions and leading them. But we suffered some genuine setbacks. I mean, we were politically defeated in the period of the Cold War. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the anti-communist offensive was actually successful in the sense that uh, many unions uh, voted out their communist leaders or even expelled known communists, you know, were, put red clauses into their constitutions that you couldn't be a member of the union if you were a communist. And, you know, there was, there was a real 
uh, offensive against the communists within the trade union movement. And in the long term, it, it had its effect, right? It's, it's, it's helped to promote the weakest most reactionary elements of the union movement into leadership, the sort of the business unions, the ones who take the narrowest view of what the unions should do, that they, all they do is negotiate contracts for their own members, that they're, that they're quite passive in face of uh, government attacks on workers' rights generally, that they don't see a political role for themselves, or at best, they, they see it as contracting out their role to the, to the NDP and they, they're not vigorous in their campaigns to organize the unorganized. They don't speak on behalf of the working class. They speak only for their own members. So that, you're right, you know, like the, the, a weak union doesn't make a, a strong case for unionization to, to other people. So. But once again, that's just some, that's something we have to work on that, you know, that, um, uh, so like somebody else, somebody wrote here in the, the, uh, the chat about how the unions have been, people don't see them as able to do any good. They've been declawed. And then someone else responded. So how do we give unions teeth if their claws are stolen? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's yeah that you know what, what you're saying is yet yet another aspect of the the difficulty of the situation all right the um, you know we have to deal with, have to try to deal with all these issues at once so, so i see people are putting things into the the chat which i, I don't frankly i'm not able to follow along <laughs> the chat and speaking as well so um, maybe I'll ask some people if they want to just um, actually repeat what they said, put in the chat and, you know, say it here in, in uh, verbally in the discussion. So, yeah, see, MJ again. Yes, go ahead. Hey, Naomi. Um, I know some of the people um, in the chat have also spoken to me, I think, in the last year or so. Um, and I, I was saying that um you know you have to educate while also doing all these other things at the same time because we're starting at a baseline of um not even just zero but there are actually a lot of people are anti-communist in the sense of um cold war propaganda and other elements of, of our um, country's history has turned people against anything useful so you kind of have to de-escalate that while also trying to activate them. And so there is no base. If you were to start a union with a bunch of people who are anti-communist, eventually it will burn down, right? So you have to kind of do everything at once while also starting somewhere. And um, I think that's, that brings me to some you know, conversations I've had with some people I, I recognize. Um, one person asked me last year, you know, he wants to start a union, but his workplace does not have one. Or he wants to, or other people want to start a union where their industry or sector of the economy might have a weak or failing union. You know, what do we do when we're starting from absolute zero? Well, in fact, though, we aren't starting from absolute zero. There are unions, right? The fact that unions even exist and have an official, you know, rec get recognition in our country uh, is the outcome of long, difficult struggle. Uh, and so it's not this, it isn't quite starting from zero, but it's starting from a situation which is even more complicated than zero right? um, because of the, you know, of past history. But I'd also, you know, I'd also like to point out that th there are ways of getting involved with people, of getting people actively involved in struggles with, without having to wait for them to come around to be socialists or even, you know, particularly progressive. If an, if an issue speaks to them, then, you know, if you can talk to people about the issues that affect them and talk in terms of what can we do to work together to fight for a change in government policy or to put forward an alternate policy that in itself is 
is be, you know be, is beginning a process of uh, you know that would we would hope might result in in people reevaluating their political uh, assumptions. Like for example, um, Corinne could probably talk more about this. Like the uh, the campaign up to, to prevent coal mining in the in the parks was a rather successful in the sense that it did draw in different social groups because there were different groups who would have been adversely affected by coal mining in the parks besides the environmentalists who opposed it um, you know from a general principle there were the there were specifically the the parks and wilderness the you know mountain climbing kind of people who wanted the parks preserved but there were also the the agricultural interests downstream who were be, who would be threatened by the contamination of water that they relied on um, southern in southern Alberta it's rather dry and they need that water so people who would not normally be considered in the you know front ranks of resistance to the government could be drawn all drawn together to support uh, a campaign in this case you know the campaign to prevent uh, coal mining in, in parks because it was in their interest to do so. So we we don't only we don't only talk to people about abstract ideas. I mean, I think actually the the, ent the entrance point to a conversation is to find where they have an interest in common with the working class. So uh, you know, I'll mention another example like the, the municipalities, the small the mayors of small municipalities in Alberta. Have been speaking out about the the problem of the 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 energy sector corporations just not paying up their taxes right? uh, because those those municipalities are really up against it for finances. So even you know like the mayors of small towns in Alberta who are not a particularly Bolshevik group, they're in a position you know they're they're forced into a position where they really have are criticizing the government and they're really you know they're they're having to talk directly about what those what corporations are doing wrong and so i think you know there are cases there are going to be issues that really do seriously impact people if you if the if we start with talking about the issue that really does affect them and as much as possible relate that to to a larger issues and to more to other issues to bring the more and more of those people diverse people together into one movement with one program, that would be success. So I see Karine's hand is up. Karine, go ahead. Yeah, I just had to take my mute off. Yeah, I, I think we were very successful. We also, you didn't mention the indigenous people we involved. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were three sectors that we were managing to pull together there. The tourist sector was one because of their interest in, in drawing people into the mountains. The cities also are dependent on that water. Mm -hmm. The ranchers, and also the indigenous people. So there was a, another sector and we were in trying to do some similar work with regard to the tailings in Northern Alberta, uh, trying to draw different organizations uh, working on uh, environmental issues and native people together. So we have a hell of a lot of issues that hit a very responsive note when you get out there. And we got a lot of potential actually in trying to draw different peoples together. So it's... Um, there's no lack of issues. But I do think that, you know, uh, ultimately what what works is when the issues, the issues that people care about are also, you know, re really relate back to pocketbook issues, like when they can see that they're direct short term uh, interests are threatened in the same way as their long-term collective interests. When if those th two things come together, that can be a you know, that can really be a spark for um, meaningful organization, meaningful activity. Um, so people people can be aware of their own short-term individual interests. Our job is to show them how that relates to their long-term collective interests. This is whether it's unionization or really any political activity or political movement as well. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody else? I don't, I don't see any hands up now. Uh, Mike, go ahead. I guess I'll just chime in because I uh, contributed in chat there and I'll just, uh, say it again out loud. So um, my background is, is software engineering and I've, I've got some biases there, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, about a month ago, I was working at um, actually Samsung and I kind of got fed up with capitalism and quit my job and I've been looking for a better way to spend my time. And um, it seems to me like a, a big issue right now is the extent to which capitalism controls the narrative. And with everything that's been going down with Twitter and Elon Musk and um, what I feel is, is a really sort of bad take on freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. um, freedom of speech right now is basically if you have enough money, then you're free to say whatever you want to as many people as you want. Um, but when like, freedom is ultimately like freedom of action and in a capitalist system, your freedom is fundamentally limited by how much access to capital you have. Um, and so I'm, I'm just trying to build a, a platform that's not motivated by profit mm -hmm. and that uh, maybe gives people an avenue for organizing and communicating and um, hopefully it evolves into a safe space for people to discuss their values and, and ways that they can pursue those values and um, basically just be a, a communications platform to assist with organizing. And uh, well, hopefully I'll more to share about that as, <laughs> as the weeks go on. Yeah. Right. Well, that, that's great. I mean, one, one of the areas in which, you know, we it, just in practical terms, we have not fully exploited the opportunities that there are for, uh, you know, online methods of communication, you know, just basically any kind of modern forms of communication. We're not, you know, we haven't been at the forefront of that. At the same time, it's, you know, um, we, we have to always kind of keep in mind that real on the ground organizing is our ultimate goal. So I'd be, you know, really happy to see if you have, you know, can come up with, uh, uh, tools that that could be really helpful um so that's definitely the plan and and i'll um maybe try to bug you guys for some feedback once i'm a little bit further along mm -hmm. yeah sounds like a plan so okay so but i think it's it's as we we're saying before about the whole idea of nationalizing or creating workers co-ops or whatever it it all depends on the context like any any tool could have been could possibly be used you know by either the the working class against the bourgeoisie or by the bourgeoisie against the working class and of course right now it really you know you're right it's it's really the bourgeoisie has the upper hand in in maintaining control of the means of communication and it's all the all the worse in that there's a there's a superficial appearance as if it's op totally open, like anybody can, can get on to those and anybody can say anything and there's freedom of expression and freedom of speech and so on. It gives an, you know, more of an illusion that, that as if there really were a level playing field for the contention of the ideas of different classes, when as we know, really that's not so. But um, that's one of the reasons like a part, it's part of our, actual party uh, platform for our, the, that we had in the last provincial election, and I think will continue to be part of our platform for this election, is to have a, a, public, a public utility for this purpose, right? So that, you know, a, a utility that really could be run as a nonprofit, that really could be uh, um, a means of, that something that would, would provide equal access, right, where... Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so that, that would be the ultimate goal. It's not, not that we have to rely on individuals of goodwill doing their programming in their spare time, but an actual, you know, part of the social infrastructure in the same, same way as hospitals and schools are, right? So... Mm -hmm. 
So, so Dre says, maybe we should go back to paper missives. Well, actually, we do we do use paper. Like it's it is the, the Communist Party has a newspaper, People's Voice. And it's our policy is to continue to produce a paper printed version right, of every issue. Um, in, because in part, you know, that helps us to be able to distribute it in ways that we couldn't, you know, to places where we might not be able to just gain people's attention. You know, those same people wouldn't necessarily go online to people's voice if we're handing them a paper at a picket line or a demonstration or a meeting or some, some kind of gathering. So, and, you know, we want to retain the possibility of, we, we, we want to retain our own capacity to produce paper printouts in the event that we actually, you know, get excluded from various kinds of online forums. So, okay. okay, so I see some hands up, uh, MJ again and Corinne again. So I guess in order, oh, looks like MJ lowered his hand. So Corinne, go ahead. I just had a wild sort of thing in my head. Someone is talking about organization. I had wondered, if during an election we could somehow get a regular program going, like a um, Zoom program, mm -hmm. where people could, if they got the literature, could we could have a print of the um, the Zoom thing on the the leaflet, and mm -hmm. people could come in to join and discuss questions and things like that. Um, I it's something that's happening with Eve Zangler on Mondays at four. And I notice I, I kind of get into it because I get a routine going a little bit. And I don't know if that might not be an idea just for the election to try out, to get some kind of discussion going, and then encouraging people that get the leaflet maybe to phone in or mm -hmm. to zoom in and zoom in, not phone in, but zoom in. Um, yeah, because it, it, he does seem to get sort of a regular following of people mm -hmm. building up over time. I don't know. It's just an idea to throw out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I think it's a good idea. I mean, and not just, I'm um, actually not just during the election. I mean, I, the election might be a good time to start it. Yeah. Yeah. But, and then to see how it goes. Yeah. But I mean, the, you know, there, there's, there are, I mean, there are mechanisms, like there are pe people do like regular broadcasts, whether it's podcasts. You know, which is essentially like online radio or video, you know, broadcasts, essentially kind of online TV. I mean, it is possible to do those things. And as I say, we haven't really fully exploited those. We haven't done those to the, you know, to the the, the greatest possible extent, even with a, uh, you know, relatively small organization with with small resources. And it is, that's something we need to cultivate in future. That's that's one of those ways of of reaching people. Uh, you know, and you know, meeting people where they are, and you know, in some, in many cases, that's the way that, that we're going to meet people online. That's a that's a, a reality, and you know, hope to convert those online meetings to uh, real in person meetings and actual practical work together. But you're quite right. I mean, that's a that's an an area that we need to um, cultivate and, and develop more. So. It's something we we have done a little bit of. We haven't we've for a little bit of time we had some uh, Zoom meetings around newspaper articles and the people, mm -hmm. people's voice. We haven't just done it too consistently. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are having educationals and things. Mm -hmm. so it, it would yeah. probably be just more a matter of trying to get it to be more of a consistent thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, okay. Okay, anybody else? So, any, you know, I see that there's a few people who haven't spoken up here. So I'd encourage you, anybody who hasn't said, spoken yet, got something to say. So 
you know, I see that um, something that uh, MJ just put into the chat about so many things to learn from other elements, being left liberals or even greens. Uh, so they are, as, and he points out, he works closely with them, so he's aware. They are political allies, not ideological allies. Yeah, I think that's a, you know, that's a, a useful, important point for us to remember is that we need political allies. I mean, politics is based the business of you know creating alliances. Uh, if we insist that if, that we refuse to to ally with anyone who doesn't agree with us on all points or isn't ideologically aligned with us, we're going to have a very small group of allies. And, you know, so really, what what we have to develop is we have to develop our capacity to create the greatest, the broadest possible alliances. Like find the, the, the greatest number of ways in which we could possibly find some basis of agreement, some way of working together with people, even you know, quite distant from ourselves ideologically. Because that working together is the mechanism that will start, you know, the process of, of actual discussions, you know, of actually grappling with those differences and hopefully, you know, um, that people would learn from experience that their ideology would come closer to ours. Um, we feel confident that you know Marxism does really describe the world accurately. So that the more experience people have in political activity, the the more they're going to um, come around to a Marxist point of view. I mean, we think we feel basically that reality will speak for itself, and so real life working together with people, you know, would always work more to advantage than stay, than holding aloof from them. If we can find any any forms of uh, agreement at all. So, uh, you know, on even, as I said before, even the smallest, you know, most modest practical uh, kind of uh, opening to, to find some, some form of agreement and some form of practical work. Yeah, so MJ, go ahead. Hey, Naomi, sorry, I keep uh, putting up and down my hands because I, I don't want to hijack. <laughs> um, so yeah, like there's so many things there. I, I won't go into the Greens and the left liberals like Eve Engler. He's so useful. He's so good as an activist. Mm -hmm. He's not very strong on ideology, but um, you know, still useful. And there's still so much that we need to learn too. And for people, I think, on all different levels of the struggle, um, there's, you know, there's this uh, brain drain of resources, means, uh, knowing what to do and how to do it. And with so little resources, we kind of have to, um, we're, we're, we're kind of told to jump right into the fire and to kind of jump through hoops and uh, punch in all directions. But, um, you know, some of it is really just breaking it down into, the, the smallest components of like, you know, how do we make a poster? How do we, um, how do we target uh, ideas in, in in less risky ways? How do we get ideas across? And how do we differentiate? And just all these little tools. How do we use the internet in a more safe way of like communication? I think earlier there was a, a software engineer speaking. And of course, the internet is the biggest way that the left burns itself down um, all of the time due to threats um, from all different angles. So, you know, we, we have to be open minded. But I think that in the last year, I've really realized that um, the, the, the issues are so dire that the minute I stop doing anything, I just get so bored and I have to find a new way to, to do something. So even dropping like a dead drop, um, you know, a poster that does nothing a poster that does literally does not connect to taking money, getting people who would probably end up being more problem than ally, but just convey a message like this is stupid <laughs> or this other thing is great, even though um, they don't need to know who we are or what we're doing or what we want them to do eventually. We just want to plant seeds or, you know, um, you know, using some of what the anarchists have have kind of done which is really just uh, spray paint things in ways that are meaningful and get people to think in different ways and um yeah i just think that there's so many tools 
that can build uh, consciousness without directly putting people at risk or even on um, resources of absolute zero for some of us who uh, you know, are trying to kind of stay in the game on other issues, but without any you know, local um, organization or local education or local um, elements of safety. For example, policing won't keep us safe um, if we're communists um, or in other elements of being uh, disabled, people of color, LGBTQ people, lots of other elements where there's not much safety with um, you know, useful politics um, being you know, having a poster that says, oh, we're this organization or that might draw people to come to that organization just to trash it, for example. So, you know, there's lots of different ways. And I think a lot of the struggle is just what tools do we use? It's like, where do we begin? And, and where is, you know, how do we, how do we do that? How do we be useful? So, yeah, I was just going to end my brainstorm there. Sorry, just uh, mastering the, 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 the ground game is a matter of uh, learning how to do things um, that others are doing, but then adapting them to the conditions. So, you know, obviously a lot of other people can, can do a lot of these other things like use the internet in ways that are much safer. I know the Green Party can swear and be really unprofessional and super fun and <laughs> really funny, but I can't, you know, I have to be behind an anonymous um, name and organizational front because I can't uh, be targeted in the ways that they would target uh, Marxists, you know, so, uh, you know, I'll end it there. There's just so much to learn and so much to adapt to the conditions. Okay, Jesse? I think um, we also need to think about um, who we're targeting uh, with this education and uh, this propaganda and this advertising. Because um, right now, the lumpen proletariat is very, very active in Alberta. Um, and right now, they're, they're being manipulated and they're being, in a lot of cases, paid off by reactionary elements. Um, these are mostly rural individuals where, I, I from, at least from my experience, maybe I'm wrong, but rural communities don't really get a whole lot of uh, exposure to the Communist Party. Um, so that might be something to uh, look into as well. Yes, that, I mean, unfortunately, you're right about that, right? We, it's our, our presence is primarily in the, you know, the, the, the two biggest cities. We have only a, a, a scattering of members or, or friends in the, the smaller towns and even less so in actual rural areas. Um, but I think part, part of thinking strategically though is who's who, not just where the greatest numbers of people are, but who's most important to the economy. And I think it does come back to uh, the working class and to the, um, those who are, you know, to basically two sectors. One is like the, the energy sector, the resource extraction sector, because that is the basis of the economy in Alberta. I mean, that's not what we want it to be. We would prefer to, you know, to see it diversified. I mean, it's our policy that it should be diversified. And we should be developing secondary industry, um, you know, to provide employment and to increase productivity, that we should not remain um, a resource extraction economy, but the reality is that's the case. And so the workers in that sector are critical, you know, are really important. The other being the public sector workers, because they're the ones who are at the front line of the of the attack. They're the ones directly under attack when uh, you know funding is cut for for healthcare or for education. Um, those are the workers whose whose jobs are most directly involved or whose, you know, whose working conditions are most directly affected. Um, so, and, but also they, they have the, they do have uh, more of the large scale union organizing uh, in Alberta, really than any other sector. Oh, right? yeah. But nurses in general, um, the, 
provincial government employees in general, right? Those are a couple of the biggest unions um, because just because of the nature of the economy, um, in part because of the, um, you know, the, the successful anti-union campaign by the, the corporate sector that there's, there isn't the level of unionization in the energy sector and the supporting workers in the energy sector that we would, that we would certainly like to see. So, so those, like, we, you know, we have a message for, for all members of the working class, and we actually have a message for all classes. Um, but, you know, even some of the, some members of the, the bourgeoisie, like the smaller national bourgeoisie, there's maybe a role for them in an anti-monopoly coalition. But nonetheless, the strategically important workers are, you know, I think we have to sort of focus in on who's really the most important with our limited resources. We're certainly, we're not going to turn away anybody who's, who's interested in coming and talking to us. We're not going to, we're not going to um, repudiate opportunities to talk to others, but our, I think our planned um, campaigns need, do need to be focused on some sectors of the working class and the ones that are, I think, most susceptible to the message and most important, even if they're the ones not so, not so susceptible, the ones who are strategically most important. So, well, I, I throw in a third category there, which is because of this, the, you know, long-term importance of organizing people who are now in like the, in precarious employment, that that's another set, another set of workers, you know, very numerous um, that, you know, we should be paying particular attention to the service industry, because um, the whether they in fact can successfully organize into unions will have a big impact on you know labor standards wages the strength of the working class movement um, the relative you know balance of power between the classes in in Alberta in general it'll make a big difference whether those precarious workers are or are not successfully organized so, yeah. Corinne. Um Somebody said, the, oh, it's Virginia, yes. mm -hmm. somebody said the long-term proletariat was organizing. How is this happening exactly? I'm not quite sure I understand this. Whoever said that, maybe they could clarify that. Yeah, somebody said that. Yeah, Jesse, go ahead. Yeah, that was me. So we have the, the big um, example that we have is Freedom Convoy. Mm -hmm. um, which has been largely organized uh, using the Olympian proletariat from um, what we know as capitalist sources, often from the United States. A lot of funding going into these very precariously employed or unemployed individuals um, who have nothing better to do but to go to Ottawa and, and voice their concerns that they've been, uh, you know, led to led to voice because it's much easier, frankly, to blame immigration or blame a government rather than blaming capitalist powers that are presently possibly paying you for the ills that you're experiencing. Um, and this has happened lots throughout history. The Lumpen proletariat has been um, always something of a source of ammunition for reactionary forces. And we're seeing that now in Canada. Well, like, do those people make a living out of crime and somehow they're being paid to be in the freedom convoy or something like that? Some of them are, yeah. Oh, how do you know? We have sources um, suggesting that they have um, been given money. Some of these major players have been given, given money from uh, large corporate interests, including from the United States. Oh, okay, and they make their living at a crime or something like that? I'm sorry? And they make their living at a crime? Make what a crime? A I... living out of crime. Oh, no, they're not living out of crime. The Olympic proletariat aren't necessarily criminals. I they, um, they do include the uh, unemployed, the precariously employed, um, and those who um, those those who tend, tend to form form themselves around that uh, underclass. Well, I, th I think it's it it's complex, right? Like class is actually a complex complex thing, and there aren't necessarily really clear cut dividing lines. Like what what divides the precariously uh, employed worker from the lumpen the precariously employed lumpen you know like there's you know there, there's many factors there's fuzzy boundaries so like 
the, the most um, sort of iconic and clear cut definition of, you know, like where it's really clear that somebody's lumping would be like, they've never held a job. They, they, they engage in petty crime for a living. Uh, you know, they're demor they, they're demor socially demoralized and, you know, so, you know, um, alienated from, from working class members of their family and so on. You know, that would be really obvious cases, but there's all, you know, there's, there's just, uh, Lots of gray areas in between and sort of intermediate cases. I think I think you know we can say that even without making the distinctions between the lumpen proletariat and the working class and other classes, that people who are insecure, like that their employment is threatened, even if they're not in what we what we refer to as precarious employment sectors, people who are insecure. Uh, you know their their fears can be can be played upon by the the you know right wing propaganda and the uh, populist sort of uh, movements and so on that you know of attempting essentially attempting to turn workers against each other with you know scapegoating and and false false explanations of where the problem comes from. So you know when people are scared, they're not thinking straight. Essentially, so um, so the the precarity of their employment and the insecurity of their the long term job prospects is an you know it's an important factor, and it's that's the reason it's really important for us to address uh, the issues of uh, just trans what's some call just transition, like to focus on you know full employment and income. Uh, security to actually address the real you know fears and worries that people have to, to bring them, them around to a you know a more um, realistic and more class conscious point of view so I see a couple of hands up here John and then Scott yeah Jonathan go ahead Oh, sorry, we're not hearing you. Okay, so Jonathan, I see I see your microphone, but we don't hear you. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna actually go on to Scott. Maybe we can try Jonathan again later. Hi, thanks, Naomi. Um, I just want to double check, make sure you can hear me. Yes, we do. Awesome. Uh, so I just uh, part of what you said, and um, I'm I'm kind of new here. I'm, I'm learning, so uh, forgive me a little bit. But um, lifelong Albertan, and uh, I think especially kind of in um, after COVID, uh, there is a lot of uh, as you kind of mentioned populist sentiment, a lot of kind of anti-government sentiment, uh, especially with the Trudeau government uh, in this province, um, and and a lot within the working class that I'm seeing that um, I think that is something that I don't have necessarily the answers, uh, but that's somewhere where the messaging I think really needs to um, focus on trying to harness that that populist energy, but for um, you know, a communist cause, because at, at the end of the day, uh, I, I believe it, it is possible, but it hinges, uh, I think it's, it's continues coming up, it hinges on education uh, and trying to be able to approach some of uh, some people uh, across Alberta where um, with these ideas without having them, uh, the, the, that demonization uh, almost stopped it in, in, in its tracks, uh, it, if that makes sense. So um, no, I really appreciate the conversation. So um, yeah, thanks for letting me speak here. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jonathan, you wanna try again? See if we can hear you this time. Sorry, we're not getting anything from you there, so. Okay, anybody else? So, oh, I see he's, he's, uh, 
Oh, I see he's, Jonathan's put something into the chat, says, my apologies, Gomer, I was not sure why well, my microphone's not working. I was just going to point out that Street Church in Calgary, Calgary is heavily active in turning the lump and proletariat reactionary. Yeah. So, yeah, but there again, it's, you know, it's, um, it's, it, it all depends on context. Like, you know, even like religion, churches, they don't, they aren't necessarily always reactionary. It's also the case that some, you know, some uh, denominations and some congregations were mo are motivated by their religion to be active in the peace movement and, or to take, take part in, you know, civil rights and social justice movements. We know that the civil rights movement in the States, like, you know, the, the, the black churches in the American South were like or organizing centers for the, the civil rights movement you know, for good or real, I mean, for, you know, for all that they still have, you know, that some lim limitations because of their ideology, but nonetheless, it is also, it is certainly the case that there are churches that are definitely, you know, committed to really, re really reactionary point of view these days. And they, they're the ones that get a lot more notice. <laughs> so, you know, it is another, it's another uh, uh, a factor that, of, of the ideological struggle. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so, okay. Okay, I'm sorry that John, Jonathan is not being, apparently not able to speak to us directly. Anybody else? Okay, so, okay, I, I just, uh, I'd like to, again, let, let you know sort of what, what we're planning um, over the next little while, um, basically to have a, a discussion that's more directly focused on um, revising and developing our election platform. Uh, we know that the election's coming in May, um, so we're actually planning a provincial meeting on March 19th, in, in which we would you know, have the sort of wrap up the discussions and, and vote on a uh, what will be our election platform for this coming election this spring. So we hope to have more some uh, just you know more discussions and including if people want to 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 make suggestions in writing. Um, for what would be the, uh, what should be parts of our election platform. We started, you know, the first draft we started with is the one that was our platform in the last election. And I think it's held up quite well, uh, you know, stood the test of time. But of course, new things have happened since then. Um, you know, the, the situation, you know, the whole pandemic, the war in the Ukraine, the, you know, recent uptick in inflation and people's concerns about the cost of living, um, you know, these, these aren't reflected in there. And they, you know, I think they need to be addressed as well, like the, how that, how those um, issues play out at the provincial level, we should, you know, have some points in there in our program for that as well, uh, or sorry, our platform. So the, this is, this is discussion we'll be having over the next month and going into the election, uh, period. But also the, the um, you know, we need to, to grapple with the, how we're going to, to publicize and promote our platform between now and the election. So this involves, will also involve the practical work of making use of uh, different online platforms and different mechanisms. Uh, I hope we'll actually be able to do some, some video work or some podcast work as well. Um, and you know that this could be the the um, the time to launch some things that might last longer than just an election campaign period. So uh, at this point, okay, unless that anybody else wants to say anything more, uh, I think perhaps we can wrap it up. 